as well as it made the advisory board and the event of the advisory board more productive for all of the partners. And so it was little tweaks like that, that you you have to think about, you have these executives and uh, they have very, very busy days and you just have to be enormously respectful of that. And we, the other thing that we did was we intentionally ended the advisory board around four o'clock, which meant virtually anyone could get on a flight and get home uh, that night. We, you know, stuck to that. We were, you know, come hell or high water, we were not going to miss that that deadline of ending the meeting on time because we knew we had uh, people catching flights. So we were very respectful of your coming in. How do we make this productive? Let them get home. Those little details around the edges of this advisory board, all of those things add up and count. Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning into Channel Voices, the podcast for future channel leaders where we learn the ins and outs of partner ecosystems through casual conversations with channel professionals from a variety of industries, partner types, and geographies. My name is Maciek, and I'm your host. I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with this female channel leader who pretty much grew up in the channel. She gathered her substantial experience working at companies like Compaq Computers, Interasys Networks, Siemens, Samsung, Cisco, Riverbed, and CA Technologies, to name a few. In January 2022, she took on the role of Senior Vice President of Global Partners at Zeo. It is in this capacity where she took the initiative of creating a partner advisory board. Lynn Tinney. Welcome to Channel Voices. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for uh, for joining today's episode. Before we get into some of the questions that we and the subjects that we and that we wanted to cover today, could you please tell us a little bit about your channel background? Sure. Um, so I I feel like I uh, grew up in channels, if you will. Um, I learned uh, first. Uh, how to sell and uh, collect my own PO, if you will, in a very much a traditional direct selling model, but fell into channels pretty early on in my career and then always consistently came back to it. So I did some marketing, I did some um, sales management, um, I did strategy for a little while, uh, but really just found that my heart and what uh, really got me charged to come to work to every day was working with a set of really good partners. And um, my background is primarily in networking and security. So telecom here is a little different for me. I feel like I'm, you know, a cousin to this, but I feel like the background I have brings a ton of value to this. And it's also a great opportunity to kind of learn another side of channels here. So um, it's a it's a really good mix for where I am and what I think I can bring to Zayo. Fantastic. So. Ed, so you joined Zeo at the beginning of last year. That's right. And when you joined Zeo, obviously coming from a little bit of a different background, was there anything that you thought when you when you had the time to sit down, understand what the partner program looks like today, what the channel go to market strategy looked like? Was there anything that you thought that needed? immediate change or you had some some of your own thoughts how to how to improve things fundamentally um zeo has a long history of being a very direct oriented organization and when you really step back and you know whenever whenever you come into an organization you're you're looking at where are your gaps what do i need to fix what's low hanging fruit what's going to um, really fundamentally changed. So you're looking at that mix, if you will. And one of the things that I recognized um, coming to Zeo is it had years and years of success and a very direct-minded approach. And that can make you, um, that can make the organization very introverted. And um, it needed to get a little extroverted. <laughs> and um, and, that, and that, that had to be at a fundamental uh, level, meaning where we really sat down and as we created our channel strategy and improved it, we had to start listening. We had to start opening the doors. We had to bring 
our partners to the table. And it really pointed at probably within the first month of being here that we were going to have to develop a strong partner advisory board as soon as we were ready to do that. So it was it was really one of the things that we did that it, that directly uh, went to addressing kind of our traditional introverted habits to make us an extrovert. <laughs> so that's very interesting. The partner advisory boards, they are becoming somewhat more popular. I think companies recognize the fact that they do need um, not only listen to partners, but but they want partners to help them to structure their vision a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So when you had that thought and you got the sign off on setting up the um, the very first partner advisory board for Zeo, what vision and the structure did you did you have in mind when you started organizing this? We started probably six months before probably in April or May sometime, right after we came back from Channel Partners. First of all, at Channel Partners in April of last year, we had a breakfast. It wasn't necessarily an advisory board, but it was um, an inv- it was by invitation and it was a casual breakfast with um, many of our leaders there um, across Zao, just sitting down and listening, um, introducing themselves, you know, sharing a meal. And it was after that meeting that we realized that the Zao partners who were committed to us really had more to say and we needed to listen. And so we started, you know, months beforehand, our first advisory board was in early November, but we also knew, uh, you know, just speaking to the structure of it, we really wanted to make sure that we were speaking with partners who were touching customers. And so we specifically designed our advisory board um, to be dominated by agents and partners that um, are speaking and supporting customers. And then the other thing we recognized is we had to kind of take a um, a humility pill (laughs) (laughs) and uh, make sure that we got the a plethora of partners across the spectrum, partners that were committed to us, that we would consider trusted partners, small partners, large partners, uh, partners that we were not in good standing with and we needed to do some repair work, that we really needed to have a mix of all of that. Uh, We needed to have um, some of our, what we consider uh, QoS partners. So Zayo in January of 2022 acquired uh, QoS networks. We wanted to make sure we had great representation there as well. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had great representation from our all stream partners. Um, so we really looked at what the mix was, was critical to us. And um, we did not want to abandon our masters. We feel like that's a different conversation, but we are meeting one on one with our masters. We have planning sessions with them specifically on how we you know, mutually go to, to, to improve our go to market strategy. But uh, in terms of the structure, who we wanted, and the diversity of partners that we wanted represented at the partner was, was a very specific and surgical thought. And that's, you know, how we created our first list was very much targeted at that. And we were pleased that they all showed up, like they were thirsty to talk to us. <laughs> very good. That leads me to another question, because obviously having the list, having defined the types of partners that you wanted to sit on that advisory board. That's one thing. But organizing the the event as such and encouraging the partner participation and engagement within within the advisory board, that probably is not the easiest thing to do. So was there anything specific that you did when you were inviting them to encourage encourage them to participate in this advisory board? You mentioned all of them showed up. So I'm just wondering, how how did you get that done? Well, I, uh, a little bit of luck, I think. But I also think we earned it. In other words, we didn't do our advisory board like in June. We, weren't, we simply weren't ready for it. We didn't have enough meat on the bones. We needed some more runway to, to kind of demonstrate Zeo's commitment to the channel. And 
we didn't take this advisory board lightly. And I really feel like what came out of you know their willingness to participate was a reflection of they saw kind of the Monday through Friday hard work that we were delivering that made their attention turn our way and and say, you know, my goodness, maybe Zayo really is committed to this. We they've always loved our portfolio and what we bring to the to the table. Like that is um, often the hardest part of um, when you compete in a marketplace, and and we have that diamond in the rough. But I think it we really earned it from Monday through Friday hard work. And then I would tell you one other thing that we did early on when we were putting this advisory board together is we kind of sat down um, and I, I worked very strongly with my marketing team and particularly Chelsea stores like the, to help me create not only the objective of the advisory board and, and we kept tying back to that to make sure that the agenda um, rang true. But then at one point we in fact got a facilitator. We were very concerned that we were going to run through the day and it was going to be PowerPoint rich and not discussion rich. Death by PowerPoint. Yeah, right. <laughs> PowerPoint. And we had to have like this honest conversation with ourselves of this is not stacking up the way we want it to be. And we had to pull back and go, okay, what is it that would really change our habits to make this successful? And we brought in a facilitator that was neutral. Um, it was a terrific opportunity for us. And they were the ones who really helped us draw out those voices. And it was a turning point for us. It was really a turning point for us, meaning that it, it allowed us to draw out um, the quiet voices as well as the noisy voices, um, all size partners and whatnot. But it was that honest conversation and kind of being super critical at a very good point to step up and say that we can't do this uh, without a third party. And it made a, I thought it made a very significant difference. What was the first meeting of that advisory board? Was that within Zayo HQ or was that on neutral turf or how did you choose a location? Yeah, it was, it was in Denver, but we put it at um, a nice little boutique hotel in downtown Denver. You know, dinner was around the corner um, there were a ton of little coffee shops and uh, places to go and be. So it had a little bit of a center core to it in terms of a community. Um, but we intentionally made it close to the Denver offices to make it easy for others from Zayo to be there, first of all. But two, uh, we invited our partners to um, the day after the advisory board to come back to um, our office and spend the day there. And only a few really took advantage of that, but they were flying in, you know, they, most of them flew into Denver, um, came and stayed at our boutique hotel. We had dinner the night before, which was terrific. And then it was, you know, an eight o'clock start and it went till four o'clock. And then the next day, which I think was a Wednesday, if I remember the sequence of events, we had conference rooms and offices reserved for anyone who wanted to come back and kind of connect and take advantage of being in Denver and connect with uh, people outside of, you know, who hosted and participated in the advisory board. And although only a few people took advantage of that, one, I think the invitation to do that uh, did us well, as well as it made the advisory board and the event of the advisory board more productive for all of the partners. And so it was little tweaks like that, that you, you have to think about, you have these executives and, uh, they have very, very busy days, and you just have to be enormously respectful of that. And we, the other thing that we did was we intentionally ended the advisory board around four o'clock, which meant virtually anyone could get on a flight and get home uh, that night. We, you know, stuck to that. We were, you know, come hell or high water, we were not going to miss that that deadline of ending the meeting on time because we knew we had uh, people catching flights. So we were very respectful of your coming in. How do we make this productive? Let them get home. Those little details around the edges of this advisory board, all of those things add up and count. Now it looks like there's definitely a lot of work that goes into organizing such an event. And I suppose, yeah, to some extent, you were lucky that everybody who was invited attended, but also yeah, it speaks very highly of A, the company, and two, all the partners recognizing 
the commitment to the channel, right? Yeah. Yes, I think they needed to hear it. And you know, I, I want to be I want to be correct just a little bit. We invited I think twenty five, um, and I think twenty three showed. So it wasn't everybody, but it was darn close to everyone. Oh, wow. And yeah, so we were we were very pleased with that. And to be frank with you. When we first started planning for it and back in April or May, we were kind of like, okay, maybe 12 or 15. So we we were tickled that the enthusiasm was much higher than we thought. And so, and they were engaged that, you know, they, nearly everyone came for dinner. Um, when we start, sat down at, you know, breakfast was at 7.30. When we started at 8, uh, no one got up till 4. In fact, at one point, about 4.30, we were going to do an internal huddle and just a big debrief as, you know, my fellow Zayoites, because we had just finished the day. I wanted everything when, when people were fresh in mind, what did we learn from this and what can we take from this? The partner stayed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, and I was complimented by that. In other words, even though we had them fully engaged in every opportunity to participate and talk, we still had, you know, several that wanted great one-on-one conversations and uh, so it it lingered past the the deadline for those people who who weren't flying home that night. Right, because you had that third party facilitator, and you said it was it was of huge importance to do it that way. Obviously, it wasn't anyone from Zeo trying to get information out of the partners or asking the questions in a certain way. That must have helped quite a bit with the engagement. And on that subject, can you share any of the? I don't know, maybe most interesting or maybe the funniest thing that you heard from your partners during that very first advisory board meeting? Um, I don't know if we had anything funny necessarily happen. We certainly enjoyed the day. Like I was really tickled at how they engaged with each other. They created their own community, uh, which was brilliant. But I also felt like they were there for business. They were there. They were, everyone came with a very transparent approach of I'm here to listen. I'm going to participate. I have no expectations. You could feel a good vibe in the room of just an earnest to make this a a good day. And, um, you know, the one thing about the, you know, just back to the facilitator, not only did they make sure that all the voices got heard, but also they made sure we didn't rat hole. We were taking copious notes. He would bring us back to points that we needed to get back to. He would move us along. So it it very much, he managed the pace of the day more than I would have realized. When you're so close to something and you think of something very, very important, you're going to be the one who kind of rat holes on it. <laughs> right. And so, you know, that was another kind of, uh, side benefit of having a facilitator and making the day so productive. Obviously, you would have heard a lot of feedback from the partners. You would have heard a lot of their ideas or maybe their additional needs that that exist or um, maybe some wants as well. Mm-hmm. But how do you how do you ensure that the feedback hasn't all only been heard? But how do you incorporate it now into the strategy and into the some of the immediate or maybe midterm actions? How did you go about that? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So first of all, one of the things that we did was we did a two by two. It was at, it was t- towards the end of the day, and this two by two was a matrix around what would if you you know what if you think about the y axis it was about um, you know how much impact any of these changes would make, and then the X axis was, you know, how difficult would it be to pull off? And you could easily prioritize, you could take all of the, you could take all of the comments and whatnot and put them in a massive two by two. And then the other thing that we did was as people were walking out the door, we asked them to prioritize their top three things of what we needed to address and on a sticky, a little sticky and, you know, put it up on the board and we collected those. And so one, we had things prioritized um, in a, an anonymous way to us on what we had to look at as quickly as possible. And then the other thing that we had was we had this matrix of kind of impact versus effort. And the very first meeting, the very first follow-up meeting we had with the partners in early December 
was to review all of that with them and say, look, this is everything that you said. Uh, this is the feedback we got. Uh, we now meet um, the first Friday of every month with the advisory board. It's a recorded webinar by invite. The partners uh, always have a good showing at those. So one, we prioritized, you know, their first their first um, request was a, uh, was a deep dive on our rules of engagement. So we delivered that. We did a program update. We, the next one that's coming up is all about service delivery uh, with Brian Fleming, who leads that from Zao. And we kind of, we really have a sequence of events. Like they told us what they want to hear prioritized. And we're able to go back and also go and also demonstrate, hey, we understand that this is important, but this other one we can get done really quickly. Let's just move on it. So we have this, it's kind of those two things that the facilitation really surfaced from us that made the follow-up and the engagement. And what I see is kind of the productivity of the advisory board just feel very real time. And, you know, away from, you know, the good soft skills and relationships that you get from having one of those, but really demonstrating tangible impact. And so one of the things that we heard from the partners that I found um, somewhat surprising was just straight up communications was they want to hear more from us and that we can't rely on just a newsletter or just a webinar or just an email that we really, really have to um, look at all forms of communications and understand that we have to be open and available for questions and that it's a two way street. And then also when we do communicate to them, Again, that's another respect of their time that uh, we're not delivering fluff. And if we're asking them to read something or pay attention to a webinar or hit a social link or a blog or whatever that might be, that there is value in it um, and it's worth their two minutes. And that is the communication part, I think, just really probably took me a little bit by surprise. But, you know, looking back, it, it shouldn't have. They, you know, it shouldn't have. You know, it was one of those aha moments of right. the course, right? That's something I heard before, more than once for sure. But the partners, when they are being communicated with or the way they want to receive information, the vendor really needs to stay A, relevant with the information that they're providing and intentional, right? It's some, there has to be some kind of call to action. That's very good to hear, um, especially that you haven't stopped with that first meeting. And so you said the event took place in November and you had the first follow-up meeting with the board in December already. Yep, we have December, we've done January and February will be um, this Friday, in fact. So we'll have our third follow-up. This is absolutely um, fantastic. You're not only showing that the partners have been heard, that you're actually taken action uh, based on their feedback, but you're keeping them updated, right? Which is, I think it's very, very important. And that shows, again, that commitment to them as, as, as your partners. It's right. And I also feel like one of the things that Chelsea and I are, uh, you know, she's my partner in crime and the quality of this is we have a certain level of paranoia about that value <laughs> of, is this really valuable? Like it's important to us, but you have to turn around and go, is it important to them? Right. Like this is important to us. We want them to hear this, but we have to turn it around and go, if I was sitting on their side of the table, would I click, would I listen, would I read? And so we, I just think that that's a good, healthy paranoia that we have. Um, paying attention to that. So I don't think we're perfect by any means. I think we keep we're, we keep raising the bar for ourselves. And as proud as I am of what we've accomplished, I'm kind of even more looking forward to, you know, you know I know what's kind of coming down the pike because we're already planning for it and got the Play-Doh out of the can and whatnot. So I'm, I'm even more excited for kind of what's coming because we're really going to be ramping their feedback. They're really going to be putting fingerprints on things that we are um, just starting to construct. And so th that's, that's what I kind of see as chapter two that will start to roll out in, in really in March and April and May. So that was the, pretty much, I suppose, the channel team that you know, did 
all of that hard work, go do, got those partners into one location, get to hear their feedback. Do you enable somehow the partner advisory board to also work with other departments, with other teams? I'm thinking, you know, sales, marketing, maybe product development. There has to be goals that are being set. How do you enable the dialogue with those other departments to make sure that these goals are met and the partners understand what is expected of them, but also keeping you honest with what you're working on based on their feedback? Uh, that's a really good question. And the, and it's a very good point. When we created the advisory board, the agenda was certainly booked on, bookend by the channel team. Uh, we reviewed the program, we reviewed where we were going, we reviewed rules of engagement, we did we did a few very channel partner oriented elements within that agenda, but the bulk of that agenda was service delivery. Um, we had Bill Long, our new chief product officer there. He was, I think he was there a month. We had uh, DJ Leckwald of customer success there. We intentionally brought the other critical functions. Um, marketing was there. And so, you know, we, we recognized that we're really the ambassador to the resources of Zao. And so, one, the, the initial agenda was loaded with that. And I would also tell you, you know, we have some great, wonderful people. They're terrific speakers within Zao that we're very proud of and they're engaging. But you can give them an hour and a half and they're going to speak for an hour and 20. <laughs> and so we really had to manage their time. And say, you get 15, and then the rest of the time is the partners. And we had to kind of boil down their slides, if you will. Um, and while you're boiling down slides, you have to not lose the meat of it. Like you have to still have teeth in the presentation. So that's a tricky thing to do. But then, you know, what came out of that and the engagement that continues is because we brought all of those people to the table at the first advisory board, uh, that is the feedback that they're looking for. And so it's, it's, you know, it's one of the reasons why um, service delivery and customer success and um, marketing and all of these other elements are a part of these follow-up sessions that we're having. Um, it is by no means just the channel team. So you thought of quite a few things as you were already designing the bones of the uh, of the first meeting with the advisory board. But having that experience now, where you got it off the ground, and obviously where Zeo is in terms of their partner journey. If you were to recommend to anyone who is thinking about setting up a partner advisory board, first of all, maybe what at what stage of that company's partnership or channel maturity level, would you recommend to bring in a partner advisory board? Is there, is there something that is, I don't know, completely ridiculous and it's definitely way too early? Um, what would you recommend, basically? That's a great question. I think you have to, you should do it as soon as, as soon as you felt like you've earned it. And, and what I mean by that, that seems like an elusive kind of statement. What I mean by that is you have to put in some hard work to deserve their time and attention. And I think that that, that just really leans towards being respectful for how busy our days are and how many hours everyone is putting in. And everyone's a little threadbare sometimes. So I think that you start with respect of, of their time. And if you've earned their time, and I, and, I, and I also encourage vendors to recognize that you probably have earned it and, and not to wait too long, if you will. And then I think the other part of it is that be enormously respectful of the agenda. And we spoke about it a little bit earlier, but all of the little things around, you know, the, constructing the logistics of a, an advisory board to be respectful of their time, it, it really does make a difference. And then along the way, don't be don't be too hung up on how many people show up. We were thrilled at how many are participating in our are, are on the advisory board for us. But I was less worried about whether we were going to have 20 or we were going to have 5. I was more concerned and and I think we, you know, the team that worked 
with us to do this, we were more concerned about were we going to get authentic communication set up? Were we going to be transparent? Were we going to be willing to kind of hear the hard thing and step up and address it? And to me, if, if we had five people on the advisory board and we achieved that, then I knew it would grow. And so um, I, wasn't, I wasn't so worried about being popular as I was worried about setting the stage for very authentic communications. Fantastic. Thank you for that. That's a very good piece of advice there. And coming to the end of this conversation, and there's a question I always ask, what is the one thing you wish you knew before you started your career in channel? You said you grew up in the channel pretty much. But if you were to start again, or if you were to tell your 20-year-old self, this is something that you really need to know. What would that be? Uh, perspective. First of all, this is a phenomenal question. Like, I feel like we should ask each other this question just about <laughs> everything we do. So I love this question. Um, it's it's one thing to it's one thing to understand, uh, you know, kind of what your position is and what somebody else's position is. It's one thing to understand each other's position. It's a whole nother thing, and it's another step to understand their perspective. And what I have found that has been successful in my career is that first and foremost, I'm a channel coach to those who don't understand channel or think they understand channel, but need a little coaching to navigate it more effectively. And it's, it's a step of recognizing their perspective. And that's whether you're the perspective of a partner or the perspective of a customer or the perspective of a, a direct sales person or a direct sales manager, more than likely they have been pretty successful at the how they've done something. And it's their perspective of success of don't fix what's not broken. And so it raises your bar to understand the compelling reason why they why you can help them and whether that's a customer a partner or a direct sales person or direct sales management or executives along the way and it's not just position it's their perspective it's that that you know what they've done over the last five years 10 years 20 years that raises the bar for you to increase what is it that you're bringing to the table for them? And I also feel like it brings in a tone of making you an equal player with somebody, meaning you're not, this isn't a right or a wrong element. This is a, a one plus one equals three conversation. I can learn from you and you can learn from me. And if you start the conversation with let's learn from each other, you're, you're going to end up on the other side very productive. And, you know, I've, I've grown up with channel conflict throughout my career. Um, it will always exist. Um, I say welcome to capitalism, <laughs> <laughs> nature of what we have here. Um, but I also highly encourage my team to um, always take the high road and understand perspective rather than just position. And so... Um, it it puts a positive tone on thing, and I and I learned that. I wish I would have learned that early on in my career. I had to learn that through years. That's great. Thank you very much for for sharing this insight as well. And thank you so much, Lynn, for coming on the show, for telling us about your experience at Zeo when setting up the very first partner advisory board. It was very educational for me, and it. I think it can really help a lot of people out there who are thinking about setting up their very first advisory board and they can learn from this experience that you had and hopefully they can replicate that success as well for their own for their own companies. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having us. We're uh 
the, the conversation we've had makes me uh, raise my bar. So I, I already have thoughts on my head on things we can do better. So I so much appreciate the invite and spending the time with you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for this episode. I do hope you found it valuable. And if you did, please make sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also follow Channel Voices Podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. Or just visit channelvoices.com where you can send me a message or leave a voicemail. All of the links are listed in the show notes. And once again, I appreciate you tuning in today. Until next time.